We are live right now. So good morning from the US and good evening to India and all the global panel members and participants. My name is Sean Nalipanath. I'm the chairman of India Chamber of Commerce USA. Personally and on behalf of Dr. Frank Richter, the chairman of Horasis, I welcome everyone to this online Horasis India business meeting. And I thank you all for joining. I'm joined by my esteemed panel members from the business and industry. They are leaders to share their views and thoughts and their vision on repositioning capitalism. Uh, we have Mr. Ernest Nunes, the chief executive officer of Love for All from Mexico. Dr. Shashi Reddy, the managing partner of SRI Capital USA. Mr. Arvind Nupal, who will be joining us very soon, the chairman of Whirlpool India. Mr. Don Donal Baldev Singh, the president of Eman Group, Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Aman Amanullah, the co-founder and managing director of Omvira Mumbai, India. With this, I just wanted to let everybody know that this session is being recorded. And with that, I would like to invite our panel members for a quick 60 seconds introduction before we begin our discussion today. So with that, I would like to First, invite Mr. Ernest Nunes. Please, please go ahead. Give your your introduction, and we'll go to the next. Thank you, Sean. Good morning to all. Uh, I'm Ernesto Nunes. I'm passionate for business entrepreneurship since 25 years ago. Uh, innovation and all of them as a vehicle for human development. I have worked on projects uh, about public toilets through Mexico, through all the country, uh, uh, working with indigenous people, inclusion for people with autism and LGBT community around Mexico. Thank you, Shen. Thank you, Ernesto. Now we'll go to Dr. Sashi Reddy. Hi, my name is Sashi Reddy. Um, I've been an entrepreneur for about 20 years, India, US types of companies. For the last 10 years, I've been an active uh, early stage tech investor, again, India and US, uh, and I live in Philadelphia. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Arvind Upal. Hi, this is uh, I'm Arvind, uh, Arvind Upal. I'm basically uh, currently chairman of Whirlpool. I've been a consumer person all my life. I worked uh, in the corporate sector for more than 30 years uh, before I retired. Uh, largely Nestle and uh, Whirlpool, both consumer uh, companies, FMCD and FMCG. Uh, now I'm on the board of a few companies and I uh, basically am an advisor and consultant with some private equity, global private equity. And of course, I retain interest in all kinds of startups and corporate issues. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Donald Baldev Singh. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Donald Baldev Singh. I am an electrical engineer practicing for uh, more than 30 years. I'm a social entrepreneur, former president uh, of the National Oil Company of Trinidad and Tobago. And now I am on the carbon removal side of things with the uh, nonprofit Carbon Zero Institute of Trinidad and Tobago. I'm very active in the Caribbean and energy area. And finally, we have Mr. Aman Amanullah. Good morning and good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Aman Amanullah, and uh, I have uh, uh, you know two two types of uh, work as well as experiences that I have gone through. My, one is uh, in IT sector, um, IT infrastructure that was largely largely in the U.S. And uh, now I focus my time in infrastructure, which is. Uh, core infrastructure of uh, road sports, uh, mobility, uh, power and power distribution and things of that nature. Um, so I'm passionate about India and um, I sincerely feel India's time has come and uh, we will succeed. Um, right now I'm in the US and attending this from Houston. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you and uh, welcome to all the panel members once again. Uh, before we start, as we start this program, I just wanted to give you quickly and a little bit insight as to how, why we chose this particular project or this discussion today. And I'm sure the panel members will be uh, very active in participating and giving or sharing their views. Uh, I think it is a great opportunity to talk about the vision as the people of the United States, India and the global countries, including the leaders, believe and share that 
independent nations become very strong and they should be strong principles that lead to peace and prosperity should also be supported but while that is true people are looking to enjoy secure communication networks have more freedom to navigate while the businesses are looking to develop agreeable standards of trade and commerce investment and access to data across international borders and countries such as our patriotic leaders are asking to show respect for the law of the land etc so with that i would like to now open up a uh, first question to mr arvin upal um the first question goes yes yeah, several visionaries have clamored to make our society and economies more sustainable inclusive and a long term oriented but after the covid pandemic there is also a belief system that we can there is a chance to undertake the massive reorientation so how do you see it do you see this as an opportunity if yes why okay i think that's a uh... first of all thanks for choosing me as the first person to answer a question uh but i would say that uh, you know the question is such a loaded one that i'm going to try and take a snapshot of how to attempt to answer that question because uh, the, we can debate this endlessly and for many days together uh, so so the the topic of the conversation was repositioning capitalism and uh, so what i picked up is I'm trying to understand because you can write volumes on capitalism but what is the core issue that we're trying to address here i mean uh, why has this become such an important issue post corona uh, and what is this issue with capitalism that we're doing? so so i think the core issue with capitalism is that uh, initially it was all about inequity of distribution of wealth i think that that problem we have uh, experienced for a long while uh, but of late um capitalism is also getting criticized for a whole host of other things which largely relate to environment exploitation mm-hmm. of environment exploitation of the social issues i think the social issue has become top of mind post corona mm-hmm. and therefore when you talk esg uh, which seems to be flavor of the moment uh, i think covid has brought uh, there's been a lot of focus on governance over the years we've seen economic defaults happening and so that i'm not going to focus on governance environment there's a whole bunch of work happening on the environment rating of companies based on carbon footprints and so on and so forth so so the real question right now is social uh actually uh there is no straightforward answer right now in my mind on how we can address socialist uh just like we've addressed carbon footprint as a common platform for all companies and companies will now get rated with with a grading system and shareholders have to decide whether they want to invest in a company just for financial gain or also for uh, its environmental good i think similarly a whole rating system needs to be created for corporates where they are rated on social welfare program which is what are they doing for the society at large what are they doing for the you know uh, Uh, gender discrimination and a whole bunch of issues which relate to the to our societies corona has only brought this to light that the rich nations are doing well poor nations are doing badly the rich are doing well and the poor have have are doing well and have not are not doing well and i don't think there is so far we have had uh, a very equitable solution to now before i pass the camera uh, the, the the mic on you know uh, capitalism is, capitalism is a form of economics we very often mistake capitalism with politics so capitalism is to socialism democracy is to communism hmm. the world has turned upside down when i thought capitalism i always associate companies like america uk germany europe with capitalism uh in fact capitalism and democracy go hand in hand but what is happening now is the democracies of the world where people have freedom of speech are fundamentally challenging all the issues which are coming out of capitalism the country which has adopted capitalism and is doing extremely well with it right now not on social and environmental issues but definitely on economic issues is china so the country which has actually become the biggest capitalist country of the world 
is actually a communist country. I'm just going to park it at there because I think I'm not going to answer your question with my introduction. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you. In fact, um, so I invite uh, Dr. Sashi Reddy. Uh, Sashi looks like the, to the perspective of what uh, uh, Mr. Arvind just mentioned, I think there's another key area and key component of capitalism is the innovation structure. Yeah. So that particular a area is a focus where the innovation is in hand in hand with the market system for the capitalist nations. How do you see that happening in India? Uh, Sean, I think I lost you for a minute. Can you hear me now? So maybe uh, I, I think I know where the question is going. So maybe I'll just go ahead and uh, speak to the topic. So actually, you know, uh, my thoughts are sort of uh, similar to what we heard from Arvind, which is that, you know, uh, when, when you like think of capitalism, like really before we know what we need to fix, I think we need to understand what is Indian capitalism, because we understand capitalism in the U.S., like the free markets. We have capitalism like in the Nordics, where the focus is on well equity, making sure that people, uh, you know, have like similar opportunities and uh, wealth. Or you have like capitalism as practiced in China, where the state has a very strong influence uh, on like private ownership. So, so to me, it is what is Indian capitalism? What, how does India want to implement capitalism? And I think that's never been clear to me because one of the challenges that we have is uh, is like the policy consistency. We don't have the same policy, uh, you know, for like a long period of time. So we sort of understand what is the philosophy behind where uh, we are trying to take India in terms of uh, capitalism. So to me, that is a fundamental thing that first, let's understand what is uh, the is like the philosophical, like the grounding for how we're going to do capitalism in India. Have those policies sustain over a period of time so that, you know, entrepreneurs and others who can actually make an impact, know, under they understand the ground rules and they can actually build their businesses in a way that uh, will be able to succeed. I think the challenge here is not so much something wrong with like capitalism in India. It is just that we are not ever clear on the ground rules and keeping those fairly consistent so people can build their businesses and innovate and succeed. So I'll stop there and I hope we have Sean back. I see that it's still frozen. Am I? Are you able to see me? Uh, so maybe I can hand off to uh, Ernesto Aman or Donald. Yeah, can, you, can, you, can, you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. We can hear you, Sean. Uh, we can hear you. Uh, okay. Maybe uh, there's some network issue with uh, Reddy, uh, Sashi. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So uh, with that, uh, Mr. Donald, so India's freedom movement leaders and by and large inherited a structure of a welfare state. And although India has moved towards acceptance of capitalism in some shape and form, Dr. Sashi feels that India has to first understand what is capitalism within India. So. Does this COVID impact any opportunity to reposition capitalism? What is your thoughts? Well, I think that um, in the post-COVID and climate change world, um, we need to redefine many things, and it includes capitalism. So, in fact, I feel that it is not such an issue to try to understand the old way of capitalism, but to be part of defining the new way. So the, the, the capitalist enterprise used to be very focused on the bottom line in terms of profit. The, the social enterprise is more concerned about delivering to humanity and to community. And uh, companies operated between those two extremes of that spectrum. I think that um, we need to think about how we rebalance the, the whole business of profits and delivery to uh, humanity. And in there, with its traditional philosophies and culture and so on, is well positioned to, uh, to help to define the new form of capitalism, which makes sure that it delivers what humanity needs, what community needs, what people need, um, while it makes uh, profits. So it's going back to that basic concept of, of making sure that cooperation is focused on doing good while doing well or maybe doing well by doing good this time around. And I think that, I think that India is well positioned uh, because of its history and its approach to, uh, to the social side of it, to lead in, in this new definition of capitalism. 
Hmm. Okay. Uh, so, Aman, let me ask you. You know, we have established a view saying that you know innovation is a key aspect of it. The financial side of it is a key aspect of it. The socialism is a key aspect of it. But there's another major area which is the investment side of it as well. So, what are your views on increased role and participation of uh, private investment in creation of public infrastructure assets, and so on and so forth? Thank you, Sain. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here um, and uh, to be with uh, among the distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, thank you. Um, I think the COVID nineteen uh, created a massive, um, uh, you know, uh, breakdown in infra creation in the country, as well as uh, many of the firms, uh, you know, in India have gone through a, a difficult time in the last one and a half or two years time. Um, you know, things were, um, you know, we're, we're just turning around and this COVID happened. Now, the issue is um, how to really, I mean, uh, uh, but before you, before I go there, I must thank Sashi in instigating the thought, you know, what is India's capitalism? Uh, that's amazing. And, and Arvind, thank you. And Don, uh, you put a very good perspective. Uh, but my perspective is that... Uh, you know, um, infrastructure needs to be brought in to be done by private investments as well as uh, participation from the private investments to create the, the, the ground, to create the environment, create the ecosystem that will bring, the, uh, you know, the involvement uh, of, of the entire nation. Uh, we lack in infrastructure, unfortunately, significantly right now, Sain. And, uh, and we all know, uh, you know, the, the reasons have been, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, legacy, uh, the last 70 years, a uh, lot of things were not really done. Uh, but now things are changing. And, and what I really feel is the country at this point in time has a lot of institutions. Now, it's not that the country is lacking the sort of institution that will create the infrastructure. It is just you know, building capacity on those infrastructure institutions in the country and building the framework and the people, whether it is in the public sector, uh, which is the most important part in infra creation, right? Infra is generally a public good and public sector, whether it's the state and the municipalities or the government of India, is who is actually going to uh, supervise and, and create that infra. Uh, I am feeling uh, that uh, it, the, the financial situation and the investment situation in the country is, is not that great. We need trillions of dollars in fixing our infrastructure, which is mainly the mobility. Uh, and we are very happy. Uh, you know, India is extremely lucky to have this telecom revolution. You know that, right? Uh, we have done tremendously well on the IT. We have done tremendously well on uh, you know, uh, the drug manufacturing that you know. Uh, I think uh, when we really create the per capita infrastructure that is at par with the world, which is China and or other developed countries, right, we can see massive participation of all the people from all, you know, and it's, it could be accessible and affordable to anyone. And I think we can create a massive push for a $5 trillion economy that the that the government was talking about, right? And then 10 trillion economy in the next couple of uh, you know, decades. So the, the bottom line is, let's create an ecosystem where infrastructure could be smoothly created with private participation, create that ecosystem of the, uh, the capacity of the public institutions that can handle large infrastructures uh, and et cetera. And, and one of the sessions I was attending today, they talked about India to be the lab of innovation on infrastructure. I mean, there's a major project uh, seen going on in India right now or, or, or innovation project, which, which was the first Hyperloop project in the world, which was happening between Pune and Mumbai. And, and fortunately, I was part of that particular project. Um, you know, that project could have given governor of Maharashtra to be one of the innovators in the world. Unfortunately, COVID created a massive problem and, and things have stalled. Uh, but I think India is really there. It is just needs to create the ecosystem and the institution's capability to move forward. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Amar. I think that's a that's a that's a very good perspective that you're bringing because you're hitting to the ground there. And how does capitalism as a whole plays a major role in here is something that's to be established as what she is being alluding to before. And let's see how this goes forward. Now, Ernesto, uh, what is your perspective on repositioning capitalism? You know, we are we're only talking about India, but as a globally, how do you see that? You know, is it helping? You're coming from a different viewpoint. You're coming from Mexico. You have a good knowledge of a little bit good knowledge about India, and you also have a general understanding of how this capitalism is working here in U.S. and in Mexico. And what do you see uh, India should be doing? Thank you, Shen. Um, what I see is that um, after COVID nineteen, we need to. Oh, I mean, this conversation about uh, uh, the the. the way capitalism will take in the future has been on the table for many years uh, so on. So uh, my perspective is that uh, we r really need to consider and decision makers need to consider that the environment, uh, environment and, and human being must be uh, at the center of the discussion because uh, capitalism is, is considered as, as a form in which uh, the human beings should uh, uh, have a decent way of living, and we lost it this in this way. You know? All the capitalism is, is uh, both environment and both human being inequalities at its most, and COVID nineteen uh, uh, evidenced uh, this this happening at most. Well, we have in Mexico more than 9 million uh, pe people uh, after COVID-19 in extreme poverty. It's not a, a small number. 9 million people in extreme poverty is a lot. So we, we need really to, to reconsider. Uh, Mexico and India have uh, a lot of similarities, uh, family values, cultural values, uh, uh, so, some other coincidences in which uh, we can exchange uh, best practices. No? We need to work with corporations to, to embrace diversity, uh, to develop politics, to internet, internal policies, uh, so the people uh, can get uh, better positions. Uh, avoid inequality, uh, gender equality, LGBT opportunities, uh, break crystal ceilings for all these people in order to uh, achieve better conditions aligned to the SDGs, you know, in which we have been working for so many years. So I think there is a, a mix of, of uh, situations that we need to, to put together uh, I think we just lost him. Work yeah. For the Please. people and environment. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Ernesto. I think for a moment we just briefly just we, lo we lost you. But coming back, uh, let me come back to Erwin. Um, this, is a, this is a very vast subject. And I think there is no, uh, this is the right way or this is the wrong way. But what we're trying to generally understand is that if the repositioning of capitalism has to take place, no, how would you do it? What is your take on it? You know, if if who is responsible for it and how would you do it? And you know, if we were are responsible for and each of us are responsible to make this happen, whether it is uh, is good, whether it is bad, is not the discussion here. We're looking at the repositioning of capitalism. So from that standpoint, how would you do it? Uh, what's your thoughts, Avin? Okay, so uh, thanks for the question. Uh, so. You know, there are three as three aspects to uh, this whole repositioning work that's uh, that we're talking about, uh, which is fundamentally the flaws of capitalism. The first was governance, which I think over over a, a hundred years, a lot of work has gone behind improving governance. Uh, mm -hmm. Have we reached the end of the road? No. I think there will still be defaulters and there will still be new rules of governance which will come to ensure, you know, that uh, people with the wealth don't misuse it. So governance, I think, is the oldest and most addressed issue. Uh, 
uh, but the journey never stops. Uh, mm. The next is environment. I think what is currently largely under uh, discussion globally is the environmental issue. And what I think uh, I've seen lately is this: uh, when you log on to a company name, they give you the ranking of the company as a grading of its carbon disclosure, the CDP standard of that company. So I think uh, as far as environment is concerned, uh, just exploitation of resources for creating wealth is one issue. But now to do it in a in a sustainable, environmentally friendly way, I think globally there is a understanding of how we can match companies around the world. Has it got deployed? Not as yet. But we then give the choice to individuals that do I want to invest in this company if it's a bad rating on environment? That choice must be given to an individual. And I think the younger generation is getting acutely aware of this because they are the ones who are going to suffer the consequences of all this. The third, I think the one which has become, uh, I think, more live right now and has not been an issue till now, but has become a significant issue post-COVID. And it's probably the core topic of discussion for today, which is the social part. So in the ESG, G, I think long journey has been, E is recently started. Very little work has happened on the social front. Hmm. Now, you know, social is a very complicated subject. It's a, it's, a, it's a debate and a huge subject matter on its own. I'm sure when we started the debate on environment, nobody knew how to measure the environment. Then the fact that there are carbon footprint and then we can start to standardize this. So similarly, there is no simple way today to measure uh, social responsibility of a company. Hmm. Uh, and what are we measuring it in? Are we measuring it on gender diversity? What are we, are we me- measuring it on the good that it does in its society next to it? Uh, so what is the measure? So until we can have a global system of measure, okay, it's going to be very difficult to judge uh, how to do this on a, on a uh, how should I put it, where a consumer or an investor can judge and then take a call. Informed choice. So today we do not have the luxury of an informed choice. And hmm. therefore... I think one of the, India has been very progressive in one sense, is that we were one of the first few countries to incorporate CSR. Right. Corporate social responsibility in itself is the first step, whether it should be 2%, 5% is a moot point for discussion, but it's a step in the right direction. So CSR was the first step that India took in the direction of social responsibility. And then they outlined 10 points, which said that if you, if you spend your money on these 10 points, then you qualify for CSR. I think right now, as always, the biggest problem in India is we are very good on strategy. We are horrible on execution. And as always, uh, we have laid out, we've got great strategic thinkers, nobody willing to go and fight the battle. So right now, I think they've laid out the basic principles for CSR, but the execution is a disaster. Hmm. And I think it's a beautiful concept. Uh, it uh, it needs a lot more social dialogue. It needs a lot more dialogue and discussion and uh, focus on, you know, we may not get it right first time, but we need to focus on it. Nobody's focusing on it. Uh, most companies, and I don't want to name who, what, but the socially irresponsible companies are just using it to divert it into their friends' companies or their sisters' companies, etc. It's really not going to do any uh, justice to anyone. So there needs to be a proper uh, CSR activity and it needs to be measured properly. And uh, and it needs to be uh, a little more flexible in its approach in, in the sense that we cannot put 10 guidelines and say this is going to be valid for the next 50 years because we live in a very socially adaptable world right now. And therefore, if, and I just throw this, suppose we want to encourage employment. And we say, okay, now a lot of the CSR must go towards improving the startup environment in this country. Who better to do this than the experienced corporate sector? So they must forcefully pick up startups and mentor them and grow them and make sure that they deliver the goods. Now, what kind of startups? I'm just giving you an example. But there isn't a mechanism for this. Uh, I think it comes back to governance, governance models. It's not just a government issue. Corporate bodies need to be involved in this. So, you know, chambers of commerce need to be involved in this. The government certainly needs to be involved in this. Uh, because I think it's a wonderful concept. We are first to the world almost with this concept. But as always, 
we will let it fail and we will throw the baby out with the bath water eventually. Okay. So, uh, Shashi, Armin says that you know, the baby will be out of the bath water right now. But look at it. He also identified that you know, the key indicators has to be established first. Uh, so you can start measuring. Uh, what is your thought? Is financial inclusion and uh, inequality is one of those indicators? And how do you see uh, what should be done to make this uh, capitalism happen in India? Thank you, Sean. And uh, also, uh, like really, thank you, Arvind, for actually well, really setting the stage perfectly for the two points I had, which is, see, if I had to do like two things to, I think what, we need to fix, and it's quite urgent actually, is uh, both fall under like, the social category actually. So one is female workforce participation. India is mm -hmm. at the bottom of every ranking in the world. I think Pakistan and India are about the same, and Bangladesh and other countries which are doing much better, are much higher up. So without female workforce participation, where you say that half the population has no role in the economy, how are you going to grow the economy to anything reasonable? So I think if I had to pick one measure, we need to fix female workforce participation. That's one. The second is about leveraging technology, right? We all know the impact of technology. We've all been uh, like the beneficiaries of tech. But then we are in that minor. So I saw this fantastic study with some data. which showed that only about 70 million people in India have any real access to tech. Though, of course... Mm you claim about internet access, geophone, all those things, but actually it's only 70 million, which is 5% of the population. So I would say that, you know, how do we make sure that, how do we force the tech companies to sort of expand the way that they do their business to make sure that just like they give access to their apps to, to the upper income people, force them to then also make sure that the same functionality is also available to people who may not have the latest iPhone and so on. So, so force the tech down the pyramid. So I would say that, so in terms of the mechanism of like CSR, right, that's a great mechanism that we already have in place. How do we use that as a way to give incentives for people to hire or like more women? Um, and then also to force access of the tech way down the pyramid. I think these two things will fix a lot of uh, the part of the social that we're talking about. Earlier. Thank you, Sean. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, Baldev, uh, Donald, let me ask you this. Basically, Arvind as well as uh, Shashi is concurring that you know, we need to have the indicators, but we need to first understand how do you go about it. What is your perspective? Uh, how would you bring that? You know, is that the only indicators or do you have any other indicators that should be a part of this uh, focus going forward? You're muted, Donald. I'm sorry. Thank you. So... I think that what we could be looking at, uh, rather than think about what are we doing towards solving the problem, uh, we look from the problem end of it and say, how are we moving towards a solution? So what, what it could lead to is a definition of uh, where we are now and where we want to be in terms of quality of life issues. Because that is what it comes down to at this moment. And and then the indicators should be how well are we moving along that pathway towards the quality of life that we're looking for. And then we back up, we, 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 we take those indicators and move them back into government and corporate and the, um, the, the NGO sector. How are you contributing towards getting to this level that we need? It was bad enough before COVID when we had to balance issues of, of migration and poverty and inequalities of all sorts um, and uh, climate change. And then suddenly COVID interrupted all of it and, and took over all our attention. However, all those things have remained, but it's just gotten much worse now with, with COVID. I think we have to open our minds to redefining many things. Including, and it, it came out in this, in this uh, conversation already, what is the role of the government versus the private sector? Um, in Trinidad and Tobago, we have one unfortunate thing common with India, which is bureaucracy. We all inherited it, and we all nurtured it over the years. And in fact, the places that taught us bureaucracy have changed, but we have not changed enough. 
So what is the role of the government versus the private sector? A quick example, the government in our country was making a mess of vaccine uh, distribution, complete mess. They weren't able to even set up the, the appointments and all of these things properly. The private sector stepped in and took over and they almost pushed the state out of the way and they took over and they're doing a great job with distributing vaccines. So let's make room for the private sector in, in, in helping to solve the, the big problems we have. Okay. As I said. A quick, a quick feedback, Aman. I think uh, that's your favorite topic. You know? uh, Don already mentioned about the, right. bringing the private sector. So what's your quick word on that? Right. So, you know, thanks, Don. And uh, thanks, Don. Uh, you know, Donald, actually, we, we really do not have any legacy on, uh, you know, infrastructure in the last 70 years or, or 70, 60 years. I think we can really come up with the fresh, innovative ideas. Uh, we build the fresh and innovative uh, uh, structures, uh, you know, the institutions and the capability. Um, and uh, until we have a, uh, you know, and, and Donald talked about, uh, you know, let's let's talk about the, the solution, right? Uh, until Unless we have the the infrastructure that enables people to come and, and do their best, right? Um, we are not going to see the change. And, and of course, everything that uh, uh, you know, Arvind talked about, Shashi talked about, about all the CSR, that goes on. But I think my focus, uh, uh, which I wish to convey was, let's create that environment and the ecosystem and the capabilities within the country to create this massive infrastructure that will help out millions and millions of people that you, know, you don't have power. You know, we have a 0. 0.3 to 0. 0.4 kilowatt per capita generation right now compared to, you know, probably five kilowatt per capita in the U.S. Um, so so we do have a lot of gaps. We wanted to go there and uh, bringing this private investments and the trust among the people, uh, the public and the private and putting things together is the best way forward, uh, which uh, which is what uh, I submit uh, to you. So thank you. OK, thanks. And a quick word, uh, Ernesto, before I think we are coming to the almost end of the time. Um, I'll take a quick word from you and then we'll go in for a one liner. Uh, Ernesto, what's your thoughts? Do you come with everybody here or you have a different thought process here? Hmm, I mainly agree with everybody here. Uh, I think we, we, I don't have the final answer for it, but uh, I think that uh, decision makers and private sector and government should work together uh, for a better positioning for the capitalism. I, I agree with that. There is a lot of things to do in all the sectors, environmental and social sectors. Excellent. Excellent. So with that, with the interest of time, uh, we have to be on time. So I would like to invite everybody's uh, one uh, key message that you would like to deliver to your audience as they hear us. Uh, so let me go with uh, Aman first. Let's go with Aman. Thank you. Um, you know, the key message is uh, build the trust and create the infrastructure uh, with the participation of the private player and the private investments. Okay. Thank you. Donald? You're muted, Donald. My key point um, I would like to leave with is that there's a great reset going on. And it means that India does not have to follow. India can take a lead in what has to happen. Building on the great traditions and the culture and its approach uh, in the past to the social side of it. Uh, India can lead and in the process uh, solve many of the issues that exist today by revolutionizing how we, how we bring uh, private capital in and how we approach government versus private sector uh, involvement. Okay. Thank you, Donald. Ernesto, your uh, keywords, message. Uh, the key message is that we have to reconsider the, the, the human being and the environment as the center of the conversation in the repositioning of the capitalism. OK, thank you. Dr. Sashi? Let's uh, <laughs> expand the way that we are doing capitalism in India to include the female uh, part of the population we have 
very low female workforce participation. We fix that. We fix a lot of issues regarding uh, family structure, health, and all kinds of problems. So that's where I would focus. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Zah. And uh, Arvind? Uh, thanks. I, I think in the whole area of you know environmental, social, and governance, India has taken a unique leap forward in corporate social responsibility uh, compared to the rest of the world. I'd hate to see it just fall by the wayside. I think it's an absolutely fantastic concept. Uh, there's not enough support coming out from it from corporate bodies. The government has executed it, but we cannot leave it to the government to see through execution. They are, the government is the worst in this country as far as execution. The private sector is the best as far as execution. And therefore, I think it is the role of every single corporate body to make sure that CSR becomes the single most point on the agenda right now. And the monitoring and execution and fulfillment of goals that companies have set out for it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, with that, I really wanted to uh, mention that the key message here based on what our panel members have been talking about. You know, the key indicators have to be established. They are still, they are still there, but it has not been executed uh, properly. There are some more key indicators that needs to be added into the group. And But while all of this thing is true, I think the key area one should be focusing on is how do we take this and make it sustainable? How do we make that there is an inclusivity part included in this? You know, because we are, only, we are not talking, talking about one particular country. This is going to be an impact for the entire world. So it has to be globally and economically viable, uh, whatever we uh, come up with this. And that should, so there is a knowledge that needs to be identified, secured, and whatever knowledge is out there, we need to start sharing that with people. It needs investment. It needs leadership. It needs the trade that should happen in multiple directions uh, so that people can learn from each other and grow with that. Uh, so that's the key message, I think, what we would like to bring to the table here. So as a, as a moderator for this particular session, I really want to thank you. This is a very challenging and exciting time, and, but uh, we are able to connect with all of you. Uh, and I wanted to thank all the panel speakers, each one of them, Aman, Donald, Arvind, Shashi, and Ernesto. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the audience and the attendees who have been attending this particular session. I know the subject is a huge subject, but the time is very limited. So I understand there may be questions, uh, but at the same time, we're not able to help at this time. Send us all the questions if you may have. We will try and address that. And the moderators as well as the panel uh, coordinators will come back to you. Once again, thank you very much. And thank you, sir. you're all welcome thank to you. join the networking session. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank, thank you so much. much. Okay, Good talking. Thank you so much to all. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.